Welcome to our third night of our CB Matrix Old Testament Survey class. I'm Carl Laney, and it's my privilege to be your teacher for this session. And uh, we want to welcome the new cohort from Immigrant Gra uh, Gap, California. And Jordan Vaughn is the uh, trainer mentor there, so we welcome you. I understand you've been doing a little catch up, but we're glad you're with us tonight, and uh, we look forward to a good time of study together. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we are thankful that nothing takes you by surprise, that you know the end from the beginning, and that you are sovereign over all your creation. Lord, as we study tonight the, your great plan for the ages, give us insight and understanding of how it all works together, and uh, a, a new and greater appreciation of your sovereignty. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, it's good to be together tonight. We've been uh, studying the Old Testament books. We looked at Genesis on our first night, Exodus the second night. Genesis focused on the great theme of the sovereignty of God, Exodus the salvation of God. We're going to take a little side trip tonight, and I want to give you a lecture that gives you the big picture of God's plan for the ages. And as we study the Bible, it's helpful to kind of back up and see what's going on from Genesis uh, to Revelation. Um, Richard Foster uh, made a statement some years ago. He said, today a form of illiteracy abounds, which is especially dangerous because it's unrecognized. This is particularly prevalent among those of us who read the Bible regularly, memorize its verses, and are committed to the authority of Scripture. And then he says, I'm referring to our biblical and historical myopia, or nearsightedness. And he explains, he says, we lack a worldview, a vision of the whole. And he goes on to explain that we often teach Bible stories as little stories with little morals, instead of really understanding the great theology that God is presenting in his word, his great plan for the ages. And so it's helpful to get the big picture as we look at the Bible. Even before I could reach the brake pedals or the gas pedals on my dad's car, he would let me sit in his lap and steer while he operated the gas and the brakes. And that's how I learned how to drive. I taught my kids to drive uh, the same way. Uh, one of the first lessons my dad taught me as I was learning to drive was to not focus my attention immediately in front of the car because I'd be turning back and forth trying to avoid this pothole or that but rather I should look out about 30 yards ahead of the car. And as I, I found that as I did that, I kept the car going uh, in a more uh, direct, in a more clear direction, and it was a smoother drive. When I took my eyes off the distance and tried to correct for every little bump and puddle, I uh, didn't steer uh, a steady course. Well, what I'd like to do tonight is to help you to kind of back up look off to the future, see the big picture of God's great plan for the ages. His plan that extends all the way from Genesis through all the books of the Bible into the book of Revelation. Now, we'll not stop at every milepost along the way to enjoy each of the biblical stories, but you can fill in the details uh, throughout your study of the Word of God. What we want to do is focus our attention tonight on the big picture. That's uh, in our first 50 minutes. And uh, then the second hour, we'll focus our attention on the book of Leviticus. So what we discover here is that God does have a plan. He knows history ahead of time, and he's absolutely sovereign. He's the ruler of history. He knows the end from the beginning. One of the major themes of the Bible is the kingdom of God. The Old Testament predicted the kingdom of God. Jesus announced it. Repent, the kingdom is at hand. The Apostle Paul wrote about it. John the Apostle envisioned it in his book of Revelation. So we need to begin our study of God's great plan for the ages with this theme of the kingdom of God. So we think of um, the psalmist in Psalm uh, 10, verse 16. Uh, we, we discover that God's kingdom is eternal. He is king and he rules as king forever. He's the living God, the everlasting King, um, uh, Jeremiah 10, verse 10. And then in uh, Psalm 103, verse 19, we see that God's 
kingdom is universal. The psalmist writes, his sovereignty rules over all, not just over Israel, but over all, all nations. His sovereignty is unlimited. He rules both in heaven and on earth. And there are many passages of scripture that we could go to to illustrate the fact that God is the king of all creation, and he rules his creation as king. So David explains in Psalm 103, verse 19, the Lord has established his throne in the heavens. A king has to have a throne. God has a throne. He has that throne in the heavens, and his sovereignty rules over all. He has authority, it's signified by the throne. He has a realm, uh, all creation, and he has subjects, uh, the people on this earth. God's rule on earth is often de uh, uh, delegated to authorities who are raised up uh, to serve and rule for him. And we see in the Old Testament, we've got priests and prophets and kings who are raised up to rule for God. Nebuchadnezzar had to learn this. Uh, in Daniel 4, verse 17, he exclaims, The Most High is the ruler over the realm of mankind. God rules over the realm of mankind. So God is king. He's got an eternal kingdom, but... We discover that Satan came along sometime in antiquity and challenged God's universal reign over his creation. We know this created being as Satan or the devil. Uh, the Bible reveals very little about his fall, but uh, his act of sin and rebellion against God challenged God's rule and his authority. Many have wondered why God would allow this. If God is sovereign and king and rules over all, why would he allow Satan to challenge his authority? This is the problem of evil. Of course, God could have prevented Satan from challenging his authority, but why didn't he? Well, this is complex. But perhaps we could say that God permitted Satan's rebellion in order to demonstrate the greatness of his sovereign authority in the face of challenge and testing. So God allowed Satan to come along and challenge his authority in order to demonstrate that God truly is the ruler and king over all. Well, Satan fell, and uh, 1 Timothy 3, verse 6 refers to that. Uh, Revelation 12, verse 4 also refers to it. At his fall, Satan instituted a counterfeit kingdom, a kingdom that would parallel God's rule. Satan is a, an usurper, and he's claiming kingship and seeking to exercise authority that is not his. But nevertheless, uh, Paul refers to him as the god of this age, the prince of the power of the air in Ephesians 2, verse 2 that Satan actually possesses kingdoms of this world is evidenced in the temptation of Jesus, where Satan offers Jesus all the kingdoms of the world. Interestingly, Jesus didn't challenge that offer. He didn't say, no, you don't have uh, control or charge over those kingdoms. He allowed Satan to make that offer, and then he rejected it. But it seems as though Jesus recognized that the world is under Satan's usurped authority, Satan exercises a limited power over this earth, over God's sin-alienated creation. Well, if Satan has a kingdom, he needs subjects. And so in order to gain subjects into his kingdom, he tempted the first couple, Adam and Eve. And Genesis 3 tells the story of this temptation. It's, uh, I consider it the most tragic chapter in all the Bible. God made it clear. He gave a command. He says, from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day you eat from it you shall surely die. God said, eat all the fruit in this garden except the fruit from this one tree. But Satan successfully carried out a scheme to bring about the rebellion and fall of humanity. And so when Adam and Eve ate of the fruit, the consequence was immediate and conclusive, and fellowship with God was broken. And this constituted 
what we call spiritual separation or spiritual death of Adam and Eve. In addition, as God had said, Adam and Eve and their children, their posterity, became subject to physical death as well. Paul reflects on this in Romans chapter 5, and he summarizes the consequences of Adam and Eve's sin. And he says in Romans 5 verse 12 that death passed to all people because all sinned. All participated in some way with the sin of Adam and Eve. And because of their sin, God cursed the earth so that it would only bear fruit after much work, after a great deal of labor. And even today, our creation, this earth, continues to struggle under the curse that came as a result of man's sin. Paul states in Romans 8.22, we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth until now. So here we have a real mess. <laughs> God had created a perfect world for Adam and Eve, but his authority was challenged by Satan. Mankind fell into sin, and the world we live in today is under Satan's sway. It's an open rebellion against God. The world is shaking its fist in the face of its creator. Well, in view of this situation, God inaugurated a program that would glorify his name by bringing this sin-marred creation back into the blessing of restoring. That's God's great plan, to bring this sin-marred creation back into the blessing of his glorious reign. That's the only way we can be blessed is through Christ, through God reigning. Now, as with a fine jewel that has many facets, so God's singular program has several different aspects. There is a redemptive aspect to God's plan for the ages. God has determined to redeem mankind. Because of his infinite grace, God has extended himself to mankind to redeem mankind that has fallen into sin and spiritual death. So God has a program to redeem fallen man. And God also has a program uh, to reclaim his kingdom. Now, we know that God rules over all creation. But here we have a false kingdom, a counterfeit kingdom, that is taking place here on this earth. And so God wants to reclaim his kingdom rule and reassert his authority right here on earth, the authority that was challenged by Satan. There's a third aspect to God's great plan for the ages, and that's the plan for judgment on sin and sinners. Since God is holy, he cannot look upon sin with indifference, so he must execute judgment. God will execute judgment on Satan and Satan's followers, and then he will even judge this earth and purge it of all the effects of the fall, all the effects of sin. So like a diamond with many different facets, there are several different ways we can look at God's plan for the ages. God is gracious, and he unfolds this great plan, first of all, to redeem fallen humanity, then to reclaim his kingdom here on this earth, the place where it was challenged, and then to execute judgment on Satan and sin. So let's look at these facets, and we begin with the facet of redemption. In God's infinite wisdom, he not only permitted the fall of humanity into sin, but he chose to provide salvation, a salvation that would be sufficient for all people. So, how was this accomplished? How is it being accomplished, this great program of redemption, a program to provide salvation which is sufficient for all people? The seeds of this program of redemption can be traced throughout the Old Testament, but I'm going to take us back to a promise God made to Noah back in Genesis chapter 8 and 9. And what God promised Noah after the flood is that there would not be another universal destruction of humanity by flood. Even though succeeding generations would be wicked and rebellious against God, God said, I'm going to hold back the flood waters of judgment until such a time 
that sin can be dealt with fully and finally at the cross. Take a look at this diagram. <laughs> it's a picture of a great dam holding back a reservoir full of water, the floodwaters of judgment. The dam is held in place by a promise, God's promise to Noah in Genesis 8 and 9, where God says, I'll never again judge sinners by a world flood. People are going to sin. They're going to rebel against, against God. We see evidence of that every day. God says, I'm going to hold back the floodwaters of judgment until my wrath can be poured out on a single figure, the Messiah. And he'll take the judgment that humanity deserves. Instead of another flood of judgment on all humanity, all of God's judgment is going to be poured out on Jesus the Messiah, the promised Lamb of God. So God is going to give time now for the prophecies to be pre predict and, and for all the plans to be made and prepared for his pouring out of wrath on God's own son, the Messiah Jesus. So the Noahic covenant is key to this great plan in that it gives time for the redemptive program of God to be worked out. That's the key. It's going to take time for this redemptive program to work, be worked out. God could have judged every succeeding generation, just as he had judged uh, Noah's generation. But he holds back the floodwaters of judgment by a promise, the promise we find in the Noahic Covenant. The Noahic Covenant reflects God's grace. He is not willing that any should perish. And he holds back the judgment that they deserve so that Jesus, the substitute, can take their place and be judged in their stead. Well, as we continue to look at God's great plan for redemption, we see the Old Testament sacrifices, which serve to illustrate the need for redemption and the provision that God would make through a substitute, substitutionary atonement, where an innocent animal would die in the place of the guilty sinner. Now, these sacrifices, as illustrated here, were typical in that they pointed to a need which they themselves could not ultimately fulfill. They pointed to the need for a perfect sacrifice, but these sacrifices couldn't fulfill that need in and of themselves, but these sacrifices anticipated the coming of a substitute who would deal fully and finally with sin. The writer of Hebrews makes this clear. He says it's impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Hebrews 10, verse 4. The Old Testament sacrifices simply anticipated what Christ would ultimately do. When the priest laid hands on an animal and confessed the sins of the Israelite over the head of that animal, it was as if he was saying, this animal represents you. Your sins are going to be placed on the head of this animal. This animal is going to die in your place. But ultimately, Jesus is the one who is the Lamb of God, who picks up and carries away the sins of the world. It's on the basis of the Levitical sacrifices that Paul looks back and says in Romans 3.25, In the forbearance of God, he passed over sins previously committed. He passed over those sins. He didn't just sweep them under, under the rug. He knew that one day someone would have to pay the penalty for those sins. And the blood of bulls and goats couldn't do it adequately. So these sacrifices anticipate what Christ would do in satisfying wrath on sin. Wow, that's beautiful, isn't it? So God's plan for salvation uh, is further expounded in the New Testament. The Old Testament anticipates the New Testament and points to what Jesus would do. And so as we come to the New Testament, we find God's plan for his, the redemption of his people uh, further elaborated. And it can be summarized in a phrase that we're saved by grace through faith based on the blood of Jesus. By grace through faith based on the blood of Jesus. This is stated explicitly by the Apostle Paul in Ephesians 2.8, for by grace you have been saved through faith. By grace, through faith. 
And then Paul adds in verse 13 that we are brought near to God by the blood of Christ. Salvation is a divine gift. That's what the word grace means. It's something that is given, which is undeserved. We didn't deserve salvation. We didn't earn salvation. The fact that it's a gift prevents any boasting. And it means that all the glory goes to God instead of to us. You know, if we did something for our salvation, we could boast in it. But it's strictly a gift, a gift that we receive through faith. Now, this divine gift of salvation is appropriated by the individual through faith. The writer of Hebrews says that faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Hebrews 11, verse 1. And, they, and Hebrews goes on to say that without faith, it's impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is the rewarder of those who seek him. Hebrews 11, 6. Faith can be defined as belief or trust. It involves complete reliance upon God's provision of Christ's atonement. Faith by grace, through faith, complete reliance upon God's provision of Christ's atonement, and it's based on the blood of Christ. Because God is holy, he must judge sin. But because he's gracious, he provides a substitute whereby innocent blood is shed for the guilty. In the Bible, the blood represents the life that is given up in death. Under the Old Covenant, blood was not to be eaten. It was set aside, as we'll see later in Leviticus tonight, set aside for the purpose of atonement, atonement for sins. The offering of the animal's blood signified that the animal had died in the place of the sinner. The blood represents the, the life given up in death. Now, the Old Testament sacrifices were insufficient and couldn't in and of themselves provide an atonement. And so God prepared the ultimate sacrifice. God prepared his own son, Jesus, to be the sacrificial lamb, the lamb that would take away the sins of the world. And that's what John the uh, baptizer says in John chapter 1. Behold, the lamb of God who lifts up and takes away the sins of the world by grace, through faith, based on blood. Many Christians have thought that there was a different method of salvation for believers under the Old Covenant, that they were somehow saved by works instead of by grace, through faith, based on blood. But Abraham, Moses, Joshua, Isaiah, John the Baptizer, Paul, Timothy, they were all saved the same way, by grace, through faith, based on blood. Even the blood of those Old Testament animals simply anticipated the blood of Christ and what it, was, what it would accomplish. Was there a different um, a difference between uh, the Old Testament faith and what we know to be true about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus? Well, yes, there is a different content of the faith. The Old Testament saints were saved by faith in the promise of God. We're saved by faith in the fulfillment of the promise. But it's faith nevertheless. Even Abraham was declared righteous on the basis of faith. Now, you might be wondering where works fit in to God's plan of salvation. I'm going to suggest that works and faith are like two sides of the same coin. According to Paul, faith leads to works. James insists that works are the evidence of a genuine faith. Charles Rory, one of my profs at Dallas Seminary, used this illustration to uh, point to the relationship between faith and works. He says it's like a two-coupon ticket to heaven. The faith coupon is void if detached. The works coupon isn't good for the passage. <laughs> You'll not get there if you only have the works coupon. If you have the faith coupon without the works, the faith coupon is void if detached. Faith and works go hand in hand. The works don't save. But faith without works is dead, says James. Faith without works is not a genuine, biblical kind of faith. It's, it's faith 
that works, which is the kind of faith that saves. I want to emphasize that the works don't save. They're not the basis for salvation, but they are the result of it. We're saved by grace through faith unto good works that God has prepared for us to participate in. Well, when Jesus died on the cross, he gave his life in order to satisfy God's wrath on sin. And I believe the most significant moment in this great plan of salvation took place during that hour on the cross when Jesus bore the sins of all humanity. And Jesus experienced the outpouring of God's wrath on humanity's sin. Sin in the past, sin in the present, sin in the future. In fact, the writer, Apostle Paul, says that Jesus became sin in our behalf. So much did he take on our sin that he became sin, 2 Corinthians 5.21. And when that happened, the intimate fellowship that Jesus had enjoyed from eternity past with God the Father, that intimate fellowship was broken. And Jesus experienced for the first time in eternity a separation between himself and the Father. And I believe that's the background for his cry that we read in Matthew 27, 46, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus felt forsaken. Why? Because God's wrath was being poured out on him, because he was bearing the sin of humanity. It's as if the Father turned his back on the Son in the hour of his Son's greatest need. And Jesus cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Moments later, Jesus spoke the words, Te telestai, it is finished. John 19, verse 30. What was finished? Well, redemption was finished. Redemption had been accomplished by Jesus' sacrifice on the cross. And as a result of his work on the cross, Jesus could say, Truly, truly, I say unto you, He who hears my word and believes who sent him who sent me has eternal life and does not come into judgment, but is passed out of death into life. This great theme of redemption is highlighted in what uh, Jeremiah calls the New Covenant. We read about it in Jeremiah 31 and also Ezekiel 36. The writer of Hebrews quotes from Jeremiah in Hebrews chapter 8 in describing this New Covenant. This New Covenant amplifies and confirms the blessing promises given in the Abrahamic Covenant. In the Abrahamic Covenant, God had said, I will bless you. The New Covenant tells us how the blessing is to be accomplished. It's accomplished through the death and the resurrection of Jesus. The Old Covenant was conditional and temporal. On the other hand, the New Covenant is unconditional and it's everlasting. The Old Covenant came to an end when the New Covenant was inaugurated. But uh, the New Covenant is everlasting. When was this New Covenant inaugurated? Well, the writer of Hebrews it happened at the death of Jesus. In Hebrews chapter 8, verse 6, it says that the New Covenant has been enacted. It's a perfect tense in the Greek grammar there. It indicates that at a particular point in time, the New Covenant was enacted, and it continues to this day in place. So significant is this new covenant in relationship to our Christian lives that Paul, by the Spirit of God, calls us as believers ministers of a new covenant. Isn't that incredible? We are ministers of this new covenant. So much a part of it uh, are we that we are servants or ministers of this new covenant. And that's what we do when we share the gospel. We share with others what God has done through Christ and how we can enter into a covenant relationship on the basis of his shed blood. This is the great redemptive program that the Bible speaks of and presents to us as a facet of God's plan for the ages. But there's more to God's plan. There's another element of God's plan, another facet of God's plan, and that is his kingdom work. From the time when God's sovereign rule over the universe was first challenged by Satan, God has been at work. He's been at work to reassert his sovereignty 
in the sphere where it's been challenged. Where has it been challenged? It's been challenged here on this earth. Now, this work of God to reassert his kingdom authority has been called the theocratic kingdom. A theocracy is a, literally means the rule of God. And it's merely the government or the rule of God through divinely appointed rulers who are delegated God's authority. And so we have examples of this in the Bible. We've got prophets, we've got kings, we've got priests, we've got apostles. These are all theocratic rulers, people through whom God is ruling here on this earth. As we think about God's kingdom work, it's important for us to define what we have in mind by this. I suggest that God's kingdom involves a king, first and foremost, a king who rules, and a people who come under that rule. And of course, there has to be a place where that rule is recognized as having, as being, as taking place. Graham Goldsworthy, a uh, biblical scholar, has put it clearly in the words that the kingdom of God involves God's people in God's place under God's rule. I take this definition from his book, Graham Goldsworthy, Gospel and Kingdom. And uh, he's a fine biblical scholar. He has a different eschatological understanding than my own. But nevertheless, uh, I think this uh, definition is, is definitely workable because it recognizes three elements in a kingdom. You have to have people, you have to have a place, and you have to have a ruler in order to have a kingdom. It's important to recognize that God is king whether or not his rule is recognized by individuals on this earth. He still is king. His kingdom work doesn't involve the reestablishment of his kingdom authority, but rather the demonstration, the demonstration and recognition of his authority here on this earth, the place where Satan challenged his authority and his rule. So as we begin to explore this theme of God's kingdom, this facet of God's great plan for the ages, we find there are a number of biblical passages that help us to understand what is going on here. So I take us first of all to Genesis 12, verses 1 through 3. With the call of Abraham, God began to initiate some significant developments in the reestablishment of his kingdom authority here on this earth. These developments center on a promise, a promise that we've looked at before in the book of Genesis, a promise to Abraham concerning a land, a nation, and blessing. The land promise is developed later on in Deuteronomy 30, where God tells his people that they are given the title deed to the promised land. Even though they sin against God, uh, when they repent, they'll be brought back into the land. And then the nation promises are found in 2 Samuel chapter 7, where God promises David that he is going to have a son who sits on his throne and is going to rule and reign forever. And then we have blessing promises that are further developed in Jeremiah, the blessings of the new covenant, the new covenant being inaugurated by Jesus. So these three elements, a land, a nation, and a blessing, are really at the heart of God's kingdom program. You have to have a people, a nation, you have to have a place, a land, and you're going to have a blessing that comes as people place themselves under God's rule. This promise to Abraham is reaffirmed in a number of places in the book of Genesis and in the Old Testament. But what it does, it guarantees Israel a national existence, a perpetual title to the promised land, and blessings that will ultimately come to Israel and through Israel to all the nations of the earth. All the nations are going to come under God's rule through the gospel message and uh, faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. So let's see how this program, this kingdom program develops. During the time of King David, we see another significant development in this kingdom program, which uh, we've mentioned in 2 Samuel chapter 7. And here David is promised an eternal house, an eternal throne, and an eternal kingdom. 
what God was telling David is that his dynasty, his house, would always be the royal line. There would never be another royal family ruling over God's people. David's line was going to be the eternal royal line. And then the right to rule would always belong to David. He would always have a right to the throne. His descendants would always have a right to the throne. The right to rule would always belong to him. And his kingdom, his literal eternal kingdom, would never be taken away. An eternal kingdom. God was promising David that his dynasty would always be the royal dynasty, that the right to rule would belong to his descendants, and that a literal, earthly, eternal kingdom would never be taken away from his posterity. Well, we can trace this promise through the prophets who like to highlight it, but then we come to the Gospels, and Jesus announces the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. When the Jewish people of the first century heard these words, they would immediately think back to the promise that God had given to Abraham and the promise of the land and the nation and the blessing and the promise that God had given to David and the promise of a nation that would be under the rule of a Davidic descendant. All of this comes to a culmination with the announcement of Jesus. The kingdom is at hand. It's the time of fulfillment. Repent and enter into the king kingdom by welcoming the king, King Jesus. Jesus didn't guarantee that the kingdom would be immediately instituted, but he was saying that all the preparations have been made. It's at hand. And you enter into the kingdom then through faith in Jesus. <laughs> Repent. The kingdom is at hand. Enter into the kingdom now by placing your confidence, your faith in Jesus. Well, the Jews living at the time of the first century anticipated the kingdom. They were looking forward to it, and yet they rejected Jesus, and as a result, they, we find the kingdom is postponed. The problem is that they had a different idea of what the Messiah would do. They expected a powerful military ruler to chase out the Romans, but instead Jesus came as a humble savior. The most significant turning point, I believe, in his ministry was his rejection by the Jewish religious leaders when they accused him of casting out demons by the power of Satan. The decision by these Jewish leaders set the nation on the course of rejecting their Messiah. And so this was the key turning point. As the Jewish leaders rejected Jesus, so the nation rejected Jesus. But the kingdom was promised by God so it couldn't be canceled. What it could be is delayed or postponed. Since Israel would not accept their king, the kingdom would be postponed. It couldn't be canceled even by unbelief because it was based on an unconditional promise. So God delayed certain aspects of the establishment of the kingdom, the aspect of a Davidic descendant ruling on the throne. The parable in Luke chapter 19, Jesus tells the parable of the ten pounds to show that since Israel wouldn't accept their king, the kingdom was going to be postponed and the rejecting generation of Jews would be judged. And yet, because the kingdom promise was unconditional and made by God, it would one day be realized. And the ultimate realization of this kingdom comes in Revelation 20. And we see at the second coming of Jesus, the Jewish people will accept their Messiah. And after judging the nations, Jesus will set up his messianic millennial kingdom rule. He'll rule for a thousand years, Revelation 20, verses 4 through 6. But you might say, well, a thousand years isn't an eternal kingdom. No, a thousand years is only the beginning of what is going to become the kingdom of Christ that rules through all eternity. And Paul explains in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 24 through 28, that at the end of the thousand years, Christ will offer up his kingdom to God the Father, and then God and his Son Christ will rule forever. Many have wondered if there is some measure of the kingdom in the present age. 
uh, does there exist some aspect of the kingdom of God in some form or in some manner today? Some theologians will equate the church with the kingdom and they'll deny any existence of a future kingdom for Israel. On the other hand, many believe that the church and the kingdom are distinct entities and that there will be a kingdom for Israel and God's people in the future. Scripture seems to present evidence for both of these views, that there's a kingdom present and a kingdom future. And what often we tend to do is we neglect a certain body of evidence for a view that we favor instead of looking at both sides and trying to figure out how they can both fit together. I'm going to suggest that there is a kingdom in the future. This is known as the premillennial view. Premillennial means that Jesus will come before the thousand years to establish his kingdom. We find evidence of this future kingdom. Jesus said, I will not drink again the fruit of the vine until I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. He was talking about something in the future, the Father's kingdom in the future. And then we read in Luke 19, verse 11, they supposed that the kingdom of God was going to take place immediately. But it wasn't. The kingdom of God was going to be delayed. Later on in Acts 1, 6, the apostles ask, Lord, is it at this time you're restoring the kingdom to Israel? And obviously it wasn't. It wasn't that time. So it would happen later. There is evidence in Scripture that the kingdom is future. But is it only future? Others say it's present. I'm going to suggest that it's both future and present. And we see some evidence for the present aspect of the kingdom uh, today. The kingdom is in the present age, but it's not to be acquainted with the church. The church is not the kingdom. It's certainly an aspect of the kingdom. And maybe one could say it's the most visible aspect of the kingdom of God in this present age. There's evidence from Luke chapter 17. The kingdom of God is within you or among you. Jesus said Nicodemus, unless he's born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. How do you enter into the kingdom of God? On the basis of being born again. And then a, a really key text, he delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved son. We are in the kingdom on the basis of being transferred out of darkness into light through Jesus' work and our faith in him. So the kingdom is both present and future. And I like to say that the future has broken into the present, and the kingdom has been inaugurated. It's not been culminated as it will one day be. That's, that's later. But I think the miracles of Jesus show that the future has broken into the present. The things that you'd expect to take place in the kingdom were taking place during the life and the ministry of Jesus. The blind were given sight. The sick were healed. The lame were enabled to walk or cleanse. These are the kinds of things you'd expect to take place in the kingdom, as prophesied by Isaiah 35. And so when Jesus was doing his miracles, he was showing that the kingdom was present in his person. But the kingdom isn't as it will one day be. It's already now, but it's not yet as it will one day be. One could say that the kingdom order has been inaugurated, but not yet consummated. It's already here, but it's not yet here as it will be here when Jesus returns. Herman Ritterboss has said, the threshold of the great future has been reached. We're at the threshold. Now the concluding drama can begin. The concluding drama is the return of Jesus and the establishment of his kingdom here on this earth. Is there a kingdom in the present age? I believe there is. The kingdom of God involves God's people in God's place, under God's rule. Who are God's people today? Well, believers in Christ, whether Jewish or Gentile. Where is the place that God rules? He rules over his body the body of Christ. And God's rule is demonstrated on earth through Christ and his under-shepherds, the church elders. God's rule is exercised 
through Christ and his under shepherds who lead congregations today. God's people, God's place, God's rule, all the elements for the kingdom are there in this present age. We could say that the present and developing reality of the kingdom is going to be realized one day in physical form when Jesus the Messiah returns. We have a spiritual reality, a spiritual reality of the kingdom today, but it's not as it will one day be. When Jesus returns, we'll have the physical reality with Jesus sitting on the throne, Messiah's throne there in Jerusalem, ruling and reigning over the nations. So we will then in that day see the literal throne, the literal dynasty, the literal kingdom. You might chart it something like this, the kingdom of God. And as you look at the, the arrow there, you can see the church, the tribulation, the thousand year millennium, eternity. And I, I like to divide it into two sections, the shadows and the substance. We're in the shadows now. The kingdom is here today, but it's a spiritual aspect, a spiritual form of the kingdom, not the full substance as it will be when Jesus returns. You can see the arrow pointing to the church and the arrow pointing to the uh, coming of Jesus at the end of the tribulation to begin his messianic rule. The seed of the kingdom is present today. It's growing. It's developing. One day Israel, who rejected Jesus at his first advent, will recognize and accept him at his second advent. And then the kingdom that is a seed today in the shadowy forms of of anticipation will blossom into a full-grown tree with the full substance of Jesus on David's throne sitting in Jerusalem ruling and reigning over the nations and then we'll see the kingdom consummated as the prophets anticipated that it would one day be fulfilled God's kingdom is God's people in God's place under God's rule we're living in the shadows of the kingdom today during the church age one day, when Jesus returns, we'll experience the full substance of the kingdom with Jesus sitting on the throne, ruling and reigning from Jerusalem. We've looked at two aspects of God great, God's great plan for the ages. We've looked at the aspect of salvation and the aspect of the kingdom, but there's one other aspect that we need to consider, and that's the aspect of God's judgment. Having redeemed fallen man, and reclaimed his kingdom, God will now complete his work of judgment. Every major project has a cleanup job, <laughs> and God's work is no exception. Uh, God's kingdom program um, means that now there needs to be judgment on those who rejected him. And God's judgment is both contemporary now as well as eschatological future. Eschatological speaks to the future. God's judgment is presently and progressively taking place, but it has an eschatological culmination. And his judgment is going to be first and foremost on his angels who will be cast into the lake of fire for eternity. Jesus spoke of this in his Olivet Discourse. He says the eternal fire has been prepared for the devil and his angels. The wicked activities of Satan throughout the ages will be judged. He is restricted more and more in time during the, um, during the millennial kingdom. He'll be bound for a thousand years, but at the end of that period, he'll be cast into the lake of fire, and the beast and the false prophets will be thrown into the lake of fire, and Satan himself will be cast into the lake of fire and remain there for all eternity. This is the destiny of the evil one, our enemy, God's enemy, Satan himself. He sought to establish a kingdom, but ultimately he's going to be living forever in the lake of fire, God's judgment on Satan and his followers. But then there's a judge also on human followers, not just the angelic followers of Satan, but human followers. And this, I believe, is the most tragic section of the book of, of the Bible, Revelation 20, verses 11 through 15. There we see the, the wicked, unbelieving dead are raised. They appear before God at what is called the great white throne judgment. 
and the text records in Revelation 20 verse 15, if anyone's name is not found written in the book of life, he is thrown into the lake of fire. Such a tragedy, such a sad verse. And then Peter explains how this present earth will be purged and purified in preparations for a new heaven and new earth, as was prophesied by Isaiah, Isaiah 65. Because of a sin that has come upon this earth, it's become impure, it's infected, it's like a cancer, and it needs to be purged, purified, and prepared for eternity. And John concludes his revelation by announcing the establishment of the new heavens and the earth, and the end of the curse which came upon this earth because of sin. Back in Genesis chapter 3, we see that a curse came upon the earth because of sin. Revelation 22 verse 3 says there is no longer any curse. The new heavens and the new earth have been established. I think you could summarize God's great plan for the ages is simply to reverse the curse that came as a result of sin. That's the summary of God's great plan. His great plan for the ages is to reverse the curse and restore once again the blessing that God intended for this earth and for his people. We are living today between the two comings of Jesus, between his first coming and his second coming. We are participating today in God's kingdom, but at the same time we're awaiting the full consummation of God's kingdom as it will be when Jesus returns. In the face of uncertainty and misfortune, it's encouraging to know that God is in control. God is, he rules the affairs of the nations. He rules the affairs of our lives. Nothing takes him by surprise. He is absolutely sovereign. He is the king. He is the ruler of all. At the end of the book of Revelation, John says, Maranatha, come Lord Jesus, and we join him in those words. I hope this lecture has kind of stimulated your thinking about God's great plan. Let's take a 10-minute break. We'll come back, and we'll be focusing on our next book of study, the book of Leviticus.